Hello, this is Chris Temple welcoming you once again to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you socially distanced from the Vitality Stadium. This is your source of exclusive in-depth chats with personalities connected to AFC Bournemouth, including past and present players, which is the line we're going down today. Before we get going, though, here's a man with an illustrious past himself. It's the AFCB club journalist, Neil Perrick. Neil, welcome back. Hello, Chris. Good to see you again. I've never, no, no one's ever said I had an illustrious past. I think uh, a few, uh, a few words have described my past, but not illustrious. <laughs> There's a few other adjectives we could use, is there? Uh, now, onto today's guest, a man who was the first on a pretty short list to captain AFC Bournemouth in a Wembley final. He made over 150 appearances for the club. He formed a hugely successful defensive partnership with one Eddie Howe. It's a very warm welcome to the podcast to Ian Cox. Ian, great to have you. Yes, it's good to be here and thank you uh, both for having us on the show. We're going to go back in throughout your, your career and talk more about your role here at the, the club currently. But first of all, 20 odd years later to be back here working for the club as we sit here, the sun's out. We know what a great place Bournemouth is to, to live. How, how do you sort of reflect where, I guess, things have moved on over that 20 years, where you're sitting here now to the club 20 years ago? Yeah, it's, it's completely different. Yeah, completely different. When I was uh, first here 20 odd years ago, as you kind of uh, remonstrated, it's uh, it was the shadow of what it is now, you know. That's all the way how this the setup here, you know. That's all the infrastructure, you know. The way how the stadium is, I think it's beautiful. It's a nice setup, and it's uh, so it's, it's nice to be back. What does it mean to you to to be playing the kind of role that you are now back? As a, we'll come on to it a little bit more later on, but you work for the community trust now as well. Just give us a headline of the role you're you're in now here. Yeah, so I've, I've been in this role for about 18 months now, and it's uh, working at Lussell with the Community Trust. Lussell, and we deliver the National Citizen Service uh, project in Bournemouth area. Um, and it's a youth engagement project, you know, targeting 16 to 17 year olds. Um, and it's just engaging them Lussell, over the summer months to just Lussell, upskill them and just give them some personal development, really, you know, and bridging that gap from adolescence to adulthood. Great. We'll definitely come on and talk a little bit more about that later on. But let's let's go right back to the start, shall we? Back to sort of South London, if you like. Um, the first entry on your Wikipedia profile, which shouldn't always be believed, is is joining Crystal Palace from Carshalton Athletic for forty grand in nineteen ninety four. Um, fill in a couple of gaps for us in that journey. Whiteleaf, I think, was in there as well, was it? Yeah, yeah. Whiteleaf. So I started at Whiteleaf when I was probably about sixteen. Uh, like I sort of had a little two year stint in the in the youth team. Got promoted to the first team. In that time, lots of while I was playing, uh, lots of in the youth team, uh, there was a manager called Dave Garland, and Dave Garland was affiliated with Crystal Palace. So I would go down and play trial games, lots of at Palace, uh, lots of with the youth team, um, in the, the, the the actual youth setup there. Um, but I never really got taken on as a youngster, um, and it was disappointing because all I was, wanted to do is just like, sort of have the opportunity to play, you know, football and get the opportunity to just particularly just play lots of for my local team. Uh, that opportunity didn't transpire, um, so I just continued just playing the non-league circuit. So I got in the uh, first team at uh, Whiteleaf, spent three, two or three years in the first team at Whiteleaf, had clubs coming down, uh, lots of, you know, watching and so forth, but never ever, you know, kind of went on to to play lots of professional football until I went to Carshorton, got sold to Carshorton for, I think it was about £1,500, which back in there was a lot of money. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I spent like sort of 18 months at, at Car Shorten. And for me, that was quite pivotal in my journey. You know, I met a manager who, you know, was fair. You know, I met a manager who believed in me. I met a manager who wasn't just a manager. He was a coach, he was a mentor. And he was probably the first real male positive, positive male model, male role model that I had in my life, which kind of directed me on the pitch and also off the pitch. So. And that was Billy Smith, and Billy Smith was was an integral part of you know my development. Lots of making that next step onto to Crystal Palace, and as you said, lots of got sold, you know, eighteen months into my car short and journey. And, f and you mentioned fifteen hundred pound being a lot of money, forty grand for car short when you got sold to Palace. That must have been a huge amount of money. Yeah, yeah, I think it was a time where the club was struggling for a bit of money, um, and at the time we was doing really well. You know, we was at the top of the league. Um, there was myself and another guy, Darren Ennen, Lots of wheat. Just a few weeks before I signed for Palace, I was up at Middlesbrough. Um, so I had a trial up at Middlesbrough um, and I come back down, me and Darren, and I was deciding they wanted us to go back up there for another trial to have a closer look. I didn't particularly do too well in the trial. Darren done really well. So I thought they were going to take Darren on. Um, then I got the actual call. Uh, Billy said to me that Crystal Palace have put a bid in for you, but if you go back up to Middlesbrough, then they're going to withdraw the bid. So I, I, I had to take that. I had to take that opportunity, really. And, and I'm glad I did. 
I guess uh, as a, someone growing up in the, in the sort of Croydon era, I guess Palace was probably a team that a lot of people of your age coming up through non-league aspired to, to play for, didn't they? <sighs> Without a shadow of a doubt, you know, that was, that's the biggest team that we had, lots of, for the closest to me anyway. And for me, you know, lots of seeing the likes of Ian Wright, Mark Bright, John Slarko, you know, lots of playing week in, week out. You know, those were the first real introduction to football that I had. <clears throat> Sorry, where I would see lots of all these stars playing football, something that I just wanted to aspire to. Um, did, you, did you think maybe your chance had, with, with those trials coming along, non-league, and you're thinking, is my chance going to come? You're quite a late starter relatively getting through to the pro ranks. Did you think that that chance might be might have slipped away at any point? I thought it had gone. It, personally, I thought the opportunity had gone. I didn't believe that I was going to get the opportunity to play professional football. Um, as you can imagine, 22, 23, you know, it's just literally before my 23rd birthday. Uh, for me, that opportunity, that's all gone. And I was all looking at other avenues. So for me, I was just going to play non-league football and then just carve out a career, you know, that's all alongside playing non-league football. Just going to pick up on something you said earlier there about um, Billy Smith and directing you on and off the pitch. Was, it, was there a worry of you going the wrong way off the pitch? I think there was always the, the worry that I could have gone the other way. You know, living in Croydon, we didn't have much. Um, I think one thing that like my mother likes all kind of moved us out of the Croydon area was living in Causden. So it's like very rural, you know, very green, you know, away from all the trials and tribulations that was kind of going on in Croydon. But naturally we would always go back to Croydon because that's where everything was happening. So there was always that potential, you know, that I could have taken the wrong route. One of the things is that we was, we was brought up in a Christian like sort of household. And, you know, my mum was very, you know, she was very, you know, lots of firm with the fact that lots of we have to, you know, follow in the footsteps of the good one above and make sure that lots of we do the right thing. So you got your, you got your dream move to, to Crystal Palace and is it fair to say you didn't get too many chances there? Yeah, the opportunities at Palace were limited. And, you know, when I first signed for Palace, I actually hit the ground running. I thought I started off really, really well. Um, I got put into the first team squad and ironically, we went back up to Middlesbrough um, I think not just a couple of weeks after I'd signed and we ended up winning the, the, the league to, to get promoted to the, the Premiership. But after that, I don't think, you know, like, I think sometimes it takes a bit of time to adjust. Um, and that's why I think lots of, I had lots of a little time to, to adjust with. Whereas well, with only lots of training twice a week, making that adjustment and lots of training full time, it did have an impact. And it, I think I started off like the, my first few months there, it was right near the end of the season. So from the March, that's when the transfer deadline would have been in March. So from March to the end of the season, I thought I'd done really well. Coming back for pre-season, don't think I, you know, I think the, the effects of pre-season training took its toll. So I started off a little bit slower than I would have liked to, but yeah. So you, you signed for the Cherries in March 96, making your debut here in a 2-1 win against Bristol Rovers, which was a rare win against the Rovers in those days. I remember they always seemed to have the upper hand against us. What were your memories of that game, if you like? I seem to remember the local newspaper reporter giving you man of the match, even. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the game. Yeah, I remember lots of snippets of the game. I, I do recall having quite a good game. I enjoyed it, playing the centre in midfield. Um, again, it was an opportunity to play football, you know, an opportunity to lots of play in front of a crowd, play regularly. It was an opportunity mm -hmm. I couldn't turn down, but playing in front of the crowd here at Dean Court, I mean, it was probably about 5,000 or so. It was just a buzz. I loved every minute of it and I really, really enjoyed it. Just to confirm, you, is it right you were a right winger in your early days and Mel converted you? Oh, I knew I played all over the place. I played centre forward, I played lots of centre midfield, played right midfield. Um, the only place I didn't play was uh, ironically centre back, you know, and that's where I ended up. <laughs> Just tell us about, you, you touched on it earlier, the, the club that you joined then. There was a lot going on off the pitch, probably more going on off the pitch than there was on the pitch, particularly with the financial uncertainty. How much of that were you aware of? To be honest, yeah, I wasn't aware of it at all uh, when I first signed. You know, it's only once I come into the setup, you become more aware of it. You know, I was, I was just oblivious to it. I know um, George Indar, you know, was, was down here just before my kind of, like, so I come down and George said, like, so, yeah, it's a good setup, you know, that's like, so, all Mel's interested in you. So, you know, if he does get, like, so, get in touch with you, just make, just, just take the opportunity. I was coming out of contract at Palace, so it was a no brainer for me. But in terms of answer to answering your question, I was oblivious to, to whatever the off field problems that were happening here. 
um, until I actually come down. Um, and then lots of, you know, I heard a few of the boys talking about, because obviously you had the transfer window in the March, end of the season, lots of beginning of May. Then you'd have that six week, seven week break in the summer. So as you're coming close to the summer, you know, there was a few whispers about we might not get paid over the course of the summer. So that's when the penny sort of dropped and I become a bit more aware of like all the, the off-field problems. John Bailey, Matt Holland, Steve Robinson, Steve Fletcher, some big, big personalities that you came into the squad. Just tell us about those guys. You know what? They were all, all different personalities, you know, but all fantastic individuals. I think Matt Holland is one of the nicest guys that you'll ever meet in football. I think that he would always give you the time of day. Um, I think he was a fantastic footballer as well. You know, technically very, very sound, very astute, but a very quiet man off the pitch. You know, kept himself to himself, to be fair. And he was like the model professional. So I think we uh, we all could learn a lot from Matt, you know, that's all because the way how he conducted himself, the way how he carried himself on and off the pitch. So, you know, Matt getting his move and that's all the things that Matt's achieved uh, since then. You know, I think he deserved it. Uh, Robbo, John Bailey, you know, they were characters, lively. John was very lively, you know. And I love John to bits. I think he's, he's, he was a wonderful character. He would always be the first one to dig me out you know, like sort of on the pitch and off the pitch, regardless if I was captain or not. You know, he didn't mince his words. He just told it how it was. And, you know, he's straight talking, you know, like sort of to the point, you know, and he made sure that like, so if you weren't doing your job, he would make you fully aware. And he wasn't even the captain, you know, so. But yeah, John, John was brilliant. I think he was an integral part of the team here because a lot of the work, good work we did, his link up play with Youngie, you know, down at right hand side, produced a lot of fruits, you know, for us. You forgot to say anything about Steve Fletcher. We'll give you 10 seconds. Give me only 10 seconds. <laughs> Fletch, oh, well, you know what, Fletch. Fletch. Again, you know what, Fletch is a fantastic individual. You know, um, I'm not particularly happy. He dug me out last week. It was my birthday last week, and he basically said that it was my fault that he said he gave, gave, sent a video message to say that it was my fault that we we lost the Wembley final. So thanks very much for that, Fletch. You know. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy, happy birthday. <laughs> But yeah, Fletch, I think lots of the way we played, you know, we needed Fletch. You know, we needed that, the way how lots of Fletch held the ball up, you know, lots of and battled with the centre halves, you know, it gives us time to like move up the pitch um, and also play the way that we played, you know. And he wasn't just one that could battle, he was one that, you know, you could play the ball into him, lots of when he would play as well. So he wasn't just one that would win uh, the physical battles, he could play. So I think Fletch complemented the way that we played and the way that Mel wanted us to play as a team. I've uh, coxied down the years of covering uh, the Cherries games with Willow in the car. I've heard so many stories about everybody from Willow. I always like to take the chance to hear stories about Willow from people who on the other end of it. I mean, Willow obviously was a centre half as well. Um, just just give us a, your impression of Willow as a, an assistant manager, I guess, around the place at the time you were, you were playing. Yeah, it, Willow was like, Willow was really good. You know, I think uh, my time here, like so with Willow, it was it was really good. You know, again, I was making the transition going into being a centre half. So for me, I was like a fish out of water. So Willow would obviously give us advice and that's all on the training pitch. You'll tell us, you know, little things that I should be doing and shouldn't be doing. So Willow was good for me here because I was going into a position I knew nothing about, you know, so I was just going to not sort of essentially, you know, not wing it, but do my best. But I was a centre midfielder. I was more of an attacking player, you know, and as you probably know, it's a lot of times I'd want to get the ball at the back and lots will go on little mazes, but... <laughs> <laughs> that from Willow, did you? <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, a lot of times when I was doing that, Willow was telling me like, so what are you doing? Just head it and kick it, put it in the stands. <laughs> uh, that sounds exactly like Willow. Uh, you, you had a couple of Palace boys, of course, Jimmy Glass, who's, who's back here as well now himself, and Jamie Vincent, of course, mm-hmm. who was on, on loan as well. Did that help having a bit of a, a Palace link as well down there? I think so. Uh, again, as I've remonstrated a lot of times over the, you know, when I've done these these calls and videos, uh, like sort of online, I'm a quiet person by nature. So, you know, lots of coming into a new environment, you know, it takes me time to settle in. As a young man, lots of coming, lots growing up. And for me, you know, I spent all my informative years in and around London, never really ventured outside London. So coming down to Bournemouth was a breath of fresh air, but having people who you know you've you've got an affinity with and you know, lots of it helps that, that bedding in process. So having Jimmy and Jamie here helped me settle in, you know, a lot quicker than what I probably would have done if they weren't. We'll come on to uh, to 
Trinidad and Tobago at the World Cup later on because I know there's a Rio Ferdinand link in that as well. But you partnered Rio for 10 games uh, in 96-97. Uh, Neil's written there, you upstaged him on your debut. I don't remember that game personally, but you <laughs> scored in a 1-1 draw at Blackpool. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about the 18-year-old Rio back then playing with him? What is there not to remember? He was just, he was just heads and shoulders above everyone else. You know, at such a young age, you know, through training, you know, he was take things on board very quickly, like what the things that Will, uh, Willow and uh, Mel was trying to get across, you know, his technical ability, you know, the way how he was just oozed confidence, he just oozed class, you know, and you just knew that he was, you know, destined for something big, you know, lots of playing with him here for those 10 or 11 games. I was gutted when he went back, I really was, because I, I enjoyed the time with him because I was learning, you know, lots of, I was learning from this 18 year old who was, you know, lots of gonna go on and do be lots of one of the biggest things in world football. But it was um it was just an enjoyable, you know, lots of things. So again, when he went, I was I was gutted. But yeah, my time with him I, I really enjoyed. Coxie, that financial uncertainty we spoke about earlier and you, you said you sort of weren't very aware of it when you first came in. Sort of came home to roost that Friday morning in January ninety seven when the uh, the receivers turned up. What were your memories of, and don't go into the Bristol City game just yet. That's my mm. next question. Just, just your first thoughts about what was what was going on. I think there wasn't really a, a true understanding as to you know what would you know what was actually going to happen. I think we was always under the mindset that the PFA would step in. You know, like so they're not going to allow a football club to go under. Um, but when you look back to to years gone by, you know, I think Maidstone they they kind of went out of the league. So there's a history that like, so it could potentially happen. Um, but I think with us as players, I think it was a community we had here at the football club and we pulled one another through. I think it was important because, you know, the times were very testing times. Again, I think there's a misconception that just because you're playing football that, you know, you've got all this surplus amount of cash in the bank that it, it wouldn't necessarily matter. But we're human beings at the end of the day, we still got, you know, bills to pay and things like that. So. At the time, it was very unsettling, you know, very unnerving. But I think the support of our teammates who we was, I wouldn't say we was all closely knit, but we were very supportive of one another at that time. And the first game after that news had broken was away to high-flying Bristol City at mm. Ashton Gate. Everybody thought it was going to be the club's last game. You scored the winning goal, we beat them 1-0. Just that must have been a really emotional day for everybody. Just sort of give us your memories of, you know, what was going on in the change room beforehand? What was Mel's talk like and stuff like that? I can't really remember too much about what happened prior to the game, to be honest. I just, I think all we were fully aware of is that it could potentially be our last game. So I think everyone just wanted to just go and play the game as best we possibly could. You know, I know the odds were stacked heavily against us against Bristol City, but I, I was always under the mindset that like, a lot of times in, in adversity, you know, like, so you pull through, you know, and then, like through adversity, you find strength, you know, and that was like sort of very, that was demonstrated in that game. Everyone pulled through in that game. Everyone like sort of dug deep within the resources and managed to pull out a result, which was, you know, I think a, like sort of, we would have upset a few of the, the betting slips that day, for sure. There were, obviously there were redundancies at the time, including Big Willow, uh, he was made redundant. And then there was a sort of petition among supporters to, to bring him back, which then he was brought back and talking about emotional events in this club's history, probably none more so than the Winter Gardens that night. Mm. There were certainly a lot of tears that night, a lot of money raised as well. The, yeah. the, the begging bowls came out, if you like. Just you were there, I know. Just tell us about that night. I think it was, uh, as you say, it was very emotive. Um, obviously, having the, the Bristol City game um, before, I believe that's all, the, that, was, that was Friday, I think, that. that um, the Winter Gardens, and then we had Blackpool the next game, I think. Um, and I remember like, sort of the, the crowd outside like, raising money with the buckets, but the Winter Gardens was just, it was, it'd be an event I'll never forget because it just showed the community spirit. You know, everyone pulling together, um, everyone like, sort of wanting to have the football club about and not wanting this football club to, to just like, sort of just be, like, sort of kind of go like, sort of with the financial constraints. and. You know, luckily for us, we was fortunate with the community spirit, with the backing of the community that everyone managed to pull through and we managed to, you know, like sort of save the football club. But that wouldn't have been possible without the, the, the support of the football, uh, the, without the support of the community. 
Yeah, the club saved effectively by the, the AFC Bournemouth Trust Fund, which put it in the, in the hands of supporters. What part did the players sort of play in that side of things? Well, I think we just tried our best to do what we could do on the pitch, really. We, we raised awareness as much as we possibly could. But I think essentially we as players didn't necessarily do that much. I think it was more the supporters. I think I don't think we could we could only do our bit on the pitch um, and where we could like sort of be at like any fundraisers, any campaigns or you know, anything, anything that was going on, we would have to make sure we was there um, like sort of to support the calls. But for the most part, it was it was down to the community. The community were the ones that say salvaged this football club, you know, and I don't think that should be, you know, like sort of taken lightly, you know, the efforts that they did. Some achievement, by the way, in your first full season, player of the year and top goal scorer. So <laughs> that, is, that's a, that is an achievement to, to mark your coming. Yeah, well, I did say I would play centre forward, you know. <laughs> Shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. Do you remember how many you got? I think it was eight, wasn't it? Eight. Yeah, there you go. Spot on. Yeah. I, you know what? I was, I, was, I was chuffed to bits with that season because, again, like sort of the season, I, for some reason, like sort of never really started the season off well. And I remember we started, we played Watford here, our first game of the new season. I think it was 96, 97. Didn't particularly play too well. And I remember later on in that season, I ended up getting dropped. Um, and that's when I got moved back into to defence. But when I got dropped um, and I was playing in midfield that time, um, I just, all I wanted to do was just continue playing football. But, you know, I was gutted because I moved down and then I sort of, you know, then there was this uncertainty about playing. And that's the reason why I moved down really to play football. But that just galvanised me really. And, and I think lots of Mel moving us back, you know, lots sort of into a self centre half role, you know, kind of aided um, my development. The following season, Coxie, obviously the club reached the final of the auto windscreen shield at, w at Wembley. We'll come on to the final later, but in true Bournemouth fashion, it was anything but plain sailing. A comfortable 2-0 <laughs> win at Walsall in the area final. But that soon disappeared in the second leg here. Just tell us about that game. Yeah, as you said, the, the game up here at Walsall, you know, I remember like, sort of prior to the game, I like, sort of being in a hotel and we were like, all just saying to ourselves, you know, we've got a real opportunity here. You know, if we can get a result here, we go back to Dean Court, we can we can really do something. I say, like, so we had we played well up at Walsall, you know, got a 2 0 win. Um, and then Lossell like, coming back down to Dean Court, you know, it was just unbelievable. The, the, the ebbs and troughs of that game, the emotions that you actually went through in that game was just unbelievable. You know, lots of one minute, lots of the beginning, we was doing all right, and we was lots of had one foot in the final. We just had to just be safe, you know. And I think that was probably, you know, lots of what kind of made it a little bit more difficult because we, in our minds, we already had one foot in the final. If we didn't concede, if we didn't do anything silly, but I think when you're when you're defending or when you're playing like that, you know, there's too much emphasis on what's defending rather than just playing your normal natural game, and that's what we didn't particularly do, you know, which. <laughs> as you said, made it a little bit nerve wracking. I know that later on in the podcast, Chris is going to say that signing for Gillingham was obviously the biggest highlight of your <laughs> career. So the second biggest highlight must have been leading the team out at Wembley. What was that like for you, you know, years after you might thought you might not get a chance? I think it's anyone's, any uh, footballer's dream. I sort of think anyone who's a, a club captain, anyone who plays football has a dream of leading like sort of their team out at Wembley. Um, that was a dream, a dream that was fulfilled, you know, um, through like sort of the hard work of everyone, like sort of at the football club that year, because you think the year before we was possibly going to go out of business. But I think that that year, that, that day, year, leading the team out is it, just a boyhood dream. And like sort of to have that opportunity to do that with, with Bournemouth um, was, was an unbelievable experience for me. And I know it was heartbreak losing to a golden goal. And I think the only person who later on was pleased about that was Jimmy Glass, because he was credited with an own goal. And he lays claim to being the only man to have scored an own goal at Wembley and says he's scored two of the most talked about goals in the history of football with his with his winner for Carlisle. Just what was that like, that emotion, if you like? It was it was very sad. It was like a an anti-climax to a... Because, you know, you, you talk about fate and things like that. and. For me, you know, I think like with a lot of the boys, we actually thought our name was on the cup, you know, but, you know, as, as, as we talked about earlier on, Fletch has sent us a birthday message and said it was my fault for the goal. And yeah, when I look back at it, 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 it was, and I do like sort of hold myself accountable because I should have just cleared the ball, 
you know, rather than us all try and play it back to Jimmy when Jimmy was on rushing. I should have just cleared the ball. But it's it's one of them things. And I think that the, the whole experience was was a bit of an anticlimax because we wanted to, we went there to win. You know, with everything that had gone prior, we wanted to, to win that game and use that as a way of giving something back to the supporters, you know, to say thank you for, for what you've done for us over the last year and a half or so in lots of keeping us in jobs, you know, and lots of keeping us here at the football club and saving the football club, you know, in Bournemouth. We can help you go back through the video, by the way, and find a chance that Steve Fletcher missed in that game, if that would help you even out the... Uh, oh, would you Yeah, absolutely. So we, can, we can go through with minute detail <laughs> to find some a chance Fletcher should have scored to maybe share a bit of the blame, if he's oh. going to keep throwing it at you. Oh, please, please do. <laughs> we'll do that. That's my, that's my next job after this podcast. Um, thanks, by the way, to the AFCB fan base on Twitter who uh, submitted the question about how it felt to captain the side at Wembley. We'll get to some more of the supporter questions a little bit later on. But just tell us about Frank Rolling, uh, Coxie, because he partnered you in both air legs of the area final before Eddie Howe came in to play um, alongside you at Wembley but mm. the story goes that Frank refused to walk up the steps to get his runners up medal yeah to be honest with you, I don't even know too much about that to be honest so you're educating me here you know <laughs> but I think he would have been disappointed and that, that's natural I think for anyone any football footballer who have been playing they just want to play as I said before um, and obviously Frank had played the games you know prior um and also didn't have the opportunity to, to play in the final. So there was a natural disappointment there for Frank. And I, if that was me, I would have probably been the same. I would have been absolutely gutted. Um, but again, you know, lots of when an opportunity comes, you know, lots of you have to take it. And then he was lots of put into the team and, you know, he was, you know, he just flew from there. Was there some any sort of party? I know you lost, but was there any sort of party or function afterwards? Yeah, there was. Yeah, yeah, there was. I can't remember the name of the hotel, but we was in a hotel. Like sort of afterwards, yeah, it, it was good. Yeah, like sort of, it was a great experience. And I guess that like sort of, all the not all the the memories of that game, not kind of for that moment, like sort of just went. But I think it was just like sort of having a lot of reflection on like sort of how far we'd come from, you know, the days where they had the buckets outside and like sort of where we almost went out of business to like sort of the culmination where we was, you know, obviously lost the final at Wembley and having that, the after party. I think it was just a case of the, you know, us just, it was more of a reflection, a reflective celebration. Just sort of partly moving on from, from Wembley then, um, Eddie Howe, as we've mentioned, played alongside you in that final. Um, let, let's do the Eddie Howe section. Um, could you have foreseen him having the management CV that he's already got with maybe more chapters still to come? I don't think anyone could have done really, to be honest. Yeah, I think very Eddie is a very articulate, you know, young man. You know, like so he he kind of knows what he wants. You know, but I think when when you come into the team and you're just a footballer, I don't think you can actually see if someone's going to be a good manager as such. You know, um, you know, he was very quiet when he first came into the team, but he was very confident. You know, and again, like sort like like playing with Rio, you know, you end up learning things from like sort of your other the other half, so to speak. You know, so. You know, I learned lots from Eddie playing alongside him, you know, and hopefully lots of he would have learned things from me, you know, lots of while we were playing together as well. What do you think he'd say about you as a centre half partner? <laughs> <laughs> oh. what, has, what has he told you in the past about you being a centre half? I would like to think that Eddie would say that like we, we complimented each other, you know, that's, that's what I'd like to think. I think I would like to think, I think we had a good relationship on the pitch. Um, like, so when I was having a bit of a bad time, he would dig me out, you know, more often than not. You know, when I would like to go on little mazes and Eddie would be the one that lots of be at the defence, lots of making sure once I lose the ball that he would lots of get everybody back together and, and so forth. But yeah, I, I think that we had a good work, good working relationship. You know, we, you know, we worked very, very well together, you know, in the time that we played, you know, lots of in the team together. Just, just I remember my memories of Eddie when he was a young lad there. You said he was quiet, but he was, he was very meticulous uh, very professional. He was a sort of guy that would read the times rather than the sun and, and things like that. So whilst nobody could have foreseen the management CV mm -hmm. that he was going to have, there were some sort of signs that he was not saying a one-off, but slightly different. Listen, you know, as I said before, you know, you've got Matt Holland, who I like, saw for, as true professionals. I think Matt Holland was, was a, a true professional that we all learnt so much from because the way how he conducted himself, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch. And Eddie was another one because as you said, he was a true professional. He conducted himself appropriately off the pitch as well as on the pitch. So yeah, yeah, we, we all learnt massive amounts from Eddie. 
You didn't miss a game in the league for a couple of seasons, 97, 98, 98, 99. The last game of that 98, 99 season was a nil-nil home draw against Wrexham. Yeah. And it denied you a place in the playoffs. Now, that must have been a source of, well, it obviously was a source of great disappointment for everybody. You know what? I have to say, I was gutted at the end of the season because I think we spent the majority of the, the season in the top six. Um, I think we had a brief period where we was not sort of up, up in the top two. Um, but yeah, for the most part, we was top six all the way through. But when I look back, I always, and I see the game, like sort of every now and again, I always pin, I don't think the Wrexham game was the actual issue. I go back probably about five or six games to the game against Gillingham where we played fantastic, fantastically well in the first half, you know, and also we had to weather a bit of storm in the second half. They got a late winner, you know, lots of it. I think it was probably Kevin Lisby got the late winner uh, for Gillingham. And that was live on Sky Sports. So I would always pin that game as having a pivotal impact because I think if we'd won that game, we would have been fine. Or even if we got a draw, we would have been fine. But I think after that, we went on and I'm sure we lost a couple of more games after that as well. Um, so yeah, the Wrexham game was disappointing, but I think the, the damage was done lots of a few games prior to that. No, I was. I can remember exactly where I was when Kevin Lisby scored that win. I was in. I was a student in Winchester at King Alfred's College. I was in the student bar watching that game. It was on a tiny little TV in the corner, as you say, Coxie, on Sky Sports. And I remember being reason as a Gillingham fan and Bournemouth fans. A lot of them listen. No, I'm a Gillingham fan. So they won't mind me saying. <laughs> I was the opposite end of the spectrum to you when that goal went in. I'm afraid, Chris. That's not on the running order, and we're not in the slightest <laughs> interested. <laughs> Back on script, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> now, that Wrexham, the failure to, to beat Wrexham that day cost you a place in the playoffs, as we said. Now, I've spoken to a number of players from that squad in the past, and they've said that the club's inability to reach the championship in that era prompted them to, to, to look for a move because they were never going to realise that dream here. We'll come on to your move to Burnley later, but was that, was that in your thoughts or was it just purely that the club needed the money? I think... Um, I think it's probably a double-edged sword, to be honest with you. I think it's a bit of both. So I, I believe that the club obviously needed the money, you know, um, and going into the championship would have been, or having the, the opportunity to like, sort of at least get into the playoffs and, you know, get some financial, get some income that way, um, would have had an impact. But equally, lots like, sort of players wanted to move on and not having the, the opportunity to, to play at a higher level. I think, yeah, you know, that's all that was probably in the club's mind as well. The fact that, you know, they probably need to move some players on in order to bring some, you know, lots of much needed income. Uh, the fact that lots of things didn't go to plan. In those days, Coxie, not very many Bournemouth players got international call-ups. And I remember you getting your first Trinidad and Tobago call-up. And I also remember Mel Maching, um probably not being too happy about that because he was going to be losing you for games. Is it is it fair to say that he, he wasn't overly keen on you going away? Yeah, I think at the time it's, I don't think it was taken seriously personally. The, uh, like sort of having an, an international call up, going to, to play for Trinidad and Tobago, I don't believe that it had, um, like sort of it, was, it was taken with all seriousness. I think if it was, if I was getting a call up for England, you know, that's a little bit different. But, you know, we was travelling the other side of the world uh, to play lots of World Cup qualifiers. And, you know, as a player, you need to be pitting your wits against the best players, you know, whether it be here or whether it be away. So for me, you know, I, it was something I needed to do. Um, uh, but I know he wasn't particularly happy for it. And again, Mill hadn't had, um, you know, he had to look at lots of how he was going to get the best out of his squad. And he wants all his best players there, I guess, you know, to get a result on Saturday. You, uh, it's a rumour only, it's a rumour only. Can you confirm or deny that he threw the call-up papers in the bin and didn't tell you? <laughs> you know what? I can confirm. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. Uh, back in the day then, you probably that, a letter was probably the only way you'd find out, didn't they? You, you know, I don't know how far we're back we're going. But anyway, um, February 2000, um, we'll come back, as I say, we'll come back to Trinidad and Tobago and, and the World Cup of 2006 in a moment. But February 2000, um, your time here came to an end anyway as a, as a player when you joined Burnley. Stan Turnant was the uh, the manager. Um, give us your thoughts on on swapping Bournemouth for Burnley in every sense, I guess, and and what Stan Turnant was like for you, because everyone knows sort of old school, they would, they would I guess, put Stan Turnant in that <laughs> category. Yeah, um, 
so for me, like, so when, the, when I got the call, I got the call on the Monday um, that I was going to be leaving um, and I sort of just to have, make sure my bags are ready for the next day to go up to, to Burnley and sign for, for what basically we said it was going to be a club up north. Didn't even know who it was going to be. Um, and then I told you were going to a club, you didn't know which club. Yeah, this is like for, through my agent. He didn't want to like sort of kind of put the, put any like sort of, um, like, he just didn't want no one to know about it. So like, sort of, rather than telling me and like sort of, he got out, he just didn't want no one to know about it. So essentially like sort of, the next day, he knew I wanted to, you know, pit my wits against the best players. And I think over the last couple of years prior, there was a lot of interest from teams coming down, watching and possibly putting bids in and lots sort of bids weren't accepted and so forth. So for me, I knew I had to, I didn't want to stagnate at Bournemouth. So for me, leaving Bournemouth, it was, I, I wanted to leave, but I didn't want to leave. I wanted to leave to, for my own personal development, but I didn't want to leave because this was like, so for me, this was my education. You know, this was, this is what kind of put me on the path to, you know, lots of reliving lots of my dreams, that's all going forward. Um, so yeah, so it was difficult, you know, but I knew I had to take the, the opportunity and go, in terms of like leaving here, lots of leaving Mel. I, don't get me wrong, I, I enjoyed working with Mel. Mel was a fan, was fantastic for me. You know, he gave me, he was adamant he wanted me to be the captain of the football team where I did not want to be the captain, but he thrust that responsibility onto me. And I'll be forever grateful because that was always part, that was something that I needed, you know, at that time. Going to Burnley was completely different because that's where I was, I was probably one of the older players here I was going into a team where there was a lot more of it, more experienced players, and you had a manager who, who had a reputation of like sort of just getting results, you know. So, my first introduction to Stan, like sort of, you know, just it, it was all, all it's just normal, it's just fine, you know, happy and so forth. But you realise very quickly that if you did not do your job, you know, like sort of, then there's going to be problems. We'll come back to Burnley in a second, but I just wanted to go on a slight side tangent there because you mentioned about having to leave Bournemouth because you felt like you you might stagnate down here. Is that a is that a wider issue sometimes for people, not just in football but in life, in terms of comfort zone where everything's comfortable and you're sailing along and it's all very happy? You, you sort of end up sticking with it, but actually, if you push your boundaries a little yeah. bit, like you said, right, I need to go and make a step. Is that something that you would learn from that that situation? I guess I'll be without a shadow of a doubt, and it's uh, like sort of what I'm doing now working on the NCS with lots of young people. I'm constantly, lots of saying, it's about pushing young people out of their comfort zone, you know? So I can't be preaching that if I'm not gonna practice it myself or I haven't practiced it in the in the past. So yeah, I think lots of, you have to stretch yourself a little bit. You know, you haven't got to stretch yourself max, uh, lots, of, lots of massively, but if you just stretch yourself a little bit, you know, lots of, and then lots of, once you get used to that, you stretch yourself a bit more. I think lots of they talk about lots of you're learning lots of you learn more lots of when you kind of you're outside of that comfort zone rather than staying in what you know and you can go on autopilot I think you you have to push yourself coming back to, to Burnley then because your second game for Burnley was here um a one nil win for, for Burnley um how difficult was that the emotions must be all over the place yeah that was you know I've, I've been asked a few times about lots of what would be the most uh what would be the game that lots of has like the most impact on me. And I think that game especially like, sort of had a massive impact on me just purely because of the, the emotions attached to it. I still had attachment to the football club. You know, there wasn't that severance, so to speak, because there wasn't time, you know, that's all for me to, to get over my time at Bournemouth. And say, like coming back a week or so later was just, you know, you, you couldn't even write it. But for me, coming back here was probably what I needed because I think it was nice to have that opportunity to, you know, say goodbye to the sports because one minute I was here, you know, and then the next minute I was gone. So you didn't really have that opportunity to say goodbye and, you know, and so forth. But that whole day for me, you know, I mean, before kickoff, I would never, ever forget as long as I live, you know, and, you know, when they're reading out the name of the players and so forth. And then I think my name was read out and I was expecting, and believe me, I was expecting people to like sort of be booing and, you know, probably throwing some rotten fruit at us and so forth, but <laughs> the it went beyond my wildest dreams. You know, literally the whole, everyone stood up and the whole of the ground, you know, just applauded. And I was like, wow, this is unbelievable. This is unbelievable. So that moment, I wish I could capture and I'll sort of just, you know, like sort of just look back on it because that moment there has been probably the most important uh, part, you know, like sort of, of my journey because it's, as I said, there was no severance, you know, and my attachment with Bournemouth, 
Um, you see it all the time where players go back to their old clubs and, you know, they get booed. And so I was, that's exactly what I was expecting, but it wasn't the case. And it even brought a tear to my eye just before kickoff, you know, but, you know, I then had to switch on and, and not sort of try and do my job because I knew if I didn't, not Stan will be not sort of hauling us off. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't probably go in for emotion too much, Stan. Um, I guess that's one of the one of the times where you wish people had phone cameras or there was a yeah. hundred TV cameras yeah. where somebody somewhere would have had a record, yeah. a tape running in the background somewhere of your name getting read out and that reaction and all that. Yeah, and and you know what? It's not even an, it's not about having an, it's not about being an egotistical or anything like that. It's just about. You know, you get to like sort of my age now and you look back and you just think, like, so there's certain memories that you wish you could just, you know, look back on and capture. And that is one of the memories. That's probably one of my my favourite memories in football. I know we talk about, you know, the Wembley experience and, you know, you know, playing in quarterfinals of FA Cups and things like that. But that moment there, that particular moment there, you know, is imprinted on my heart. I think uh, it's probably imprinted on most of the Cherries fans' uh, hearts who were here that day as well. Um, your third game, for, I mean, it all happened in your early stages of Burnley career, Coxie, because in your third game, you then ended up playing alongside Ian Wright, obviously one of your heroes, if you like, from your, your Palace days mm. in a Burnley shirt. Yeah, and you couldn't even write that as well. It was unbelievable. For me, you know, Wrighty coming was 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 fantastic because where, like, so before we, I think we played, I can't we played Bristol Rovers our first game. Um, and then there was probably about 17, 18,000. But, you know, Wrighty come in, like, sort of just blew the crowds through the roof. And then equally, he took a lot of pressure off me. Like, so all the focus was then on Wrighty. You know, it wasn't necessarily on me as such. Um, you know, even though I, fi I signed for 500,000, you know, there wasn't that, you know, that focal point wasn't really me. It was about, you know, Ian Wright. And he was brilliant. He'd say he was an idol of mine, you know, like, sort of him. Ian Wright, Paul Gascoigne, two of my favourite players, you know, to have the opportunity to play against both of them. But Wright, he was just unbelievable. And his, you know, like, so what he generated around, like, the, the Turf Moor and Burnley, you know, galvanised us and pushed us, you know, over the finishing line to get promotion on the last day. I was going to say, your, your move was vindicated almost by that promotion. You're in the championship now. Did you sort of feel a sense of... I'm where I want to be now after all these years. Yeah, I felt that I felt I was probably two years behind schedule, to be honest with you, Neil. But I felt that, you know, this was an opportunity to to savour and just go and do my best, really. Um, it was going to be tough because obviously moving up into the championship, Stan was going to bring new players in. So it was constantly challenging for your place. You don't know if you're going to start or not. But invariably, the two, the first two seasons were really, really good. You know, we just missed out on the playoffs one season, I think, by a couple of points or one point. And then the next season, we bettered our, our point tally and we missed out by, you know, goal difference. And the Trinidad and Tobago call-up papers eventually came out of the dustbin in uh, March 2001 <laughs> when you, you made your debut playing along the likes of uh, Shaka Hislop and, and, and Dwight York against Costa Rica. What, what, what are your memories of that day? That was that game was was something else. I mean, the the, the sheer noise, the sheer uh, atmosphere playing like sort of in Costa Rica was was just ecstatic. It was just unreal, you know. Like sort of the Costa Rica game, like sort of there's a few other games. Like sort of it, it, the football is just completely different. The atmosphere that that generates, you know, is just completely different. But playing against obviously world class players, I think Paolo Wanchop was uh, playing for Costa Rica at the time. You know, to pick your wits against, like, sort of, again, top level players is where what we as players aspire to do. You know, and I know it's not here in England, but you have to go to the other side of the world to do it. But and again, it's, it's pushing yourself out of your comfort zone. Just before I hand over to Chris now, um, Bournemouth fans and Burnley fans, feel free to, to switch off now. <laughs> the reason for the Neil saying that, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it's not it's not a secret that uh, Gillingham has been my uh, my team. Obviously, I have a, a long association with this club as well. But in June 2003, Coxie, your, your footballing dreams came true when you moved to Gillingham. <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast. Um, <laughs> uh, Andy Hessenthaler, who I think it's fair to say, isn't it always hasn't wasn't always the most popular character around these parts when he was playing for Gillingham against Bournemouth. Where was your manager then? Um, don't worry, I'm not going to go on too long about that section <laughs> of your career. But just to talk us through your the Gillingham days, if you like. Yeah, so Gillingham is essentially like so where I spent most of my time, you know, coming to the end of my career. Um, like, so I spent five years there. So the first season, you know, we, we've done all right, you know, like sort of for the first part, but we, 
we was always struggling, you know, like, so we was always struggling towards the bottom end of the league. So I think the first season, we ended up staying up by one goal. The second season, we ended up getting relegated by one goal, believe it or not. So on the last day of the season, but I think I'd have, I think when I went to uh, sign for Gillingham, I don't think I'd done, I think you get to a point where you're trying to like sort of replicate what you've done in the past, but as you get older, you have to try and reinvent how you play your football and not do try to do as much as what you used to do, but still work as hard and still try and get the results. But so I think it was a reinvention process for me coming to Gillingham, uh, coming at like sort of the back end of my career. Um, so yeah, so those, the first year, I didn't particularly do myself, I don't think personally, play too well. And it's ironically only when Stan came that I kind of, my game upped, you know, like, so when he turned up like in 2004, I think it was, for me, that was like sort of, that got me going again, you know, and that was like, for me, that I started my engine back up and I ended up sort of playing, felt more like myself, you know, lots like, so of with a freedom and lots sort of with uh, just how I used to play. We spoke about some of the, the sort of coincidental happenings and just for for context, for those who don't know, this is Stan Turner, your old Burnley manager, turning up at Gillingham as the next manager after Andy Hasenthaler had been there. So you, by chance, you reunited with him. Yeah, I mean, as I said before, we spoke off, off uh, Mike before and I, I couldn't believe it when Stan turned up <laughs> at Gillingham. You know, I left uh, last, uh, Burnley in 2003, signed for Gillingham and then lots of a couple of years later, Stan Turner. But you know what? You know, I, I've got so much love and admiration for Stan because he always got the best out of me. You know, I think my last year at Burnley, I was, it was a bit of an injury ravaged season. And that was at the time as well when the the BT, I think it was the, the, the kind of the, the BT, is it? ITV Sport, ITV Digital. ITV Digital, that's yeah. it. They, they pulled the plug and all the money fell out of football and, and so forth. So, but Stan, I, I had a good relationship with Stan, you know, and, you know, I understood what he wanted for me, you know, and I sort of, he knew that, you know, he could trust and rely on me once I went on the pitch. Um, so yeah, so when he turned up at Gillingham, like, so I was very shocked, but it was a catalyst for pushing me forward and getting me going again. Gillingham obviously had a, a raft of World Cup players throughout their history. Um, I'm thinking of Brent Sancho immediately, as well as yourself uh, for Trinidad and Tobago. Now it was in your Gillingham uh, days, wasn't it, that you went to the World Cup in, in Germany with, with Trinidad and Tobago. You didn't manage to get on the pitch, which I guess was, mm. uh, first and foremost, was that a little bit of a regret? You obviously England was one of the fixtures as well. You went, but you didn't get on the pitch. How did that yeah, resonate with you? It was disappointing, to be honest, you know, very disappointing. But I think I only had myself to blame for that because, um, the, the World Cup campaign, you know, like, so I had to make decisions, like, so whether to go and play in the World Cup games. This is, be, this is before Leo Ben Harker took over. And I, I didn't go. I wanted to, like, so focus on, you know, getting a new contract, like, so here. But, you know, when you look at it, like, so this, and when I, when I look back at 2004, like, so the, how the qualifiers were working, it was like three from the group would qualify. So it would be America, um, Costa Rica, and, Mexico would be the free, but it would be a fourth. For some reason, they had like a fourth qualifying spot. So the fourth qualifying, the one that finished fourth, would then play the best team in Asia that finished in the same similar position. So that presented us with a, a fourth opportunity to get to the World Cup. So if we couldn't get to the World Cup, like sort of that way, or have a, at least given ourselves a good shot, then we didn't deserve to. But we finished fourth and before Leo Ben Harker took over, we was like sort of near the bottom. We didn't have a hope in hell really. You know, how we managed to pull it out of the bag at that time was just unbelievable. Obviously, as we say, England was one of the games uh, in that World Cup finals in Germany that England uh, won 2-0. Uh, strange again that you and Rio having played together here for, for Bournemouth all those years ago, the World Cup in 2006, you're, you're I guess in opposition at a World Cup, England against Trinidad and Tobago, although not directly. Yeah, it was, you know, I, I remember the day when the, the World Cup draw was being made and, you know, when lots of our name got pulled out and, and uh, England's name got pulled out. I mean, me and Brent were just besides ourselves. We just could not believe it. That was the perfect draw for us. You know, that was the perfect draw. Having lots of being put alongside England was just perfect, you know, because, you know, who would have even thought it? You know, lots of that we would have been pitting our wits against, you know, the superstars of England and they're superstars amongst the world. But because we've got the affiliation here in England, I think it just had that more more of an impact. And Brent Sancho, I guess your, your club mate at Gillingham was probably competing with you for a place, wasn't he? And he got it. Yeah, yeah, Brent, yeah, Brent got it. 
And again, like so, that's a testament to Sanch, really. Like so, Sanch done, you know, well in the games that he played there. But equally, like so, Sanch was committed to the calls, the World Cup calls. So when I like so, pulled out of the World Cup squad, I remember going to like so, we had to go for a trial in Trinidad. Like so, when Leo Ben Harker took over, I just basically like so, said I need to go back. It was my daughter's birthday, so I kind of left really, you know, like so, and I just come back, you know, and, and spend time like so, with my daughter. Later down the line, you know, I was kind of thinking that I saw those playing a World Cup qualified, Dennis Lawrence got sent off. So I just rang Leo Ben Harker up and I just basically said, look, you know what, I, I'm sorry for letting you down, but if you do need an extra centre half, I realise Dennis is not going to be available for the next couple of games. If you do need a centre half, then, you know, I'm just making myself available. Um, and he just said, okay, and then he just hung up. So I just thought, well, that's not going to be. <laughs> that might be the end of that. <laughs> yeah. But then I like, saw sort the of Friday afterwards, I ended up getting a letter come through, and Jimmy was saying that like, sort of, yeah, I've been called up to go and play. So, you know, Brent like, sort of, was consistent all the way through and he deserved his opportunity because he, you know, like, sort of, made the sacrifice and to go back to Trinidad when I didn't make all those sacrifices. Presumably Gillingham didn't just throw the call-up papers in the bin, did they? <laughs> to be honest, yeah, Hess was fine with it. You know, like sort of at the time, Hess was fine, you know, like sort of with the call-ups. Yeah, but when Stan comes, Stan didn't particularly want me to go because we was in a relegation fight, you know, and he wanted me to stay, you know, and not sort of fight the, you know, the, the calls really. So, yeah, it was, it was difficult. It was, like sort of back then, it's a little bit different to now, whereas like sort of they tend to have more, uh, the managers tend to have like sort of the say, whereas like now, you know, once you're called up, you know, they don't really have too much of a say. Just the last one on the, the World Cup. You were 35, I think I'm right in saying, at the time of the World Cup. So a bit like maybe when you were an early pro and you thought you, or you, you turned pro and you thought your chance might have gone. Presumably, did you think you ever get to a World Cup no. by the time you were 35? Never, never, never did I think I'd get to the World Cup. Even when it's playing in the World Cup qualifiers, I didn't think I'd get to a World Cup. You know, just purely because, you know, it just seemed so far out of our sphere, you know. But at 35, coming to the, to the back end of my career, you know, to have the opportunity to to go to the World Cup. And I know we talked about not actually playing any nuts or getting any game time, but I think that far outweighed just being in nuts or that that setting, you know, for that period of time rather than playing any game game time. Is that the end of the Gillingham section now, Chris? You can. That'll be edited out. This, this will make no sense when it uh, eventually goes to air. The <laughs> AFC Bournemouth slash Gillingham podcast. Thanks for coming in. We'll see you tomorrow. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Coxie, you left Gillingham in uh, 2008. You had a brief spell playing in non-league. Normally when players hang up their boots, they either go into coaching or open a pub. You went into the prison service. Just tell us about that. Yeah, I mean, I took a bit of time off um, and I just, you know, was probably a little bit, little bit of a loose end as to what I was going to do. You know, I was thinking to myself, what should I go into? Um, so it's probably six months later, I kind of thought I need to develop some, develop myself, and I sort of can get some some different skill sets rather than just staying what I know. Uh, so I went into the, you said the, the the prison service and worked with young offenders. Just tell us about that work, what you did. Yeah, so it's just essentially just rehabilitating young offenders. Really, they would be placed on a if they've like sort of committed an offence, not sort of outside, they'll be placed on a on the DTO, which is like a detention training order. So it was just about rehabilitating these young people through education, you know, sort of, you know, making sure that they understand the errors of their ways. Um, a lot of the time that, you know, it's not necessarily going to work, but you still have to put that work in. So it's free, be through one to one sessions, you know, con conducting key working sessions with these young people uh, and building lots or some kind of, you know, affiliation with them. So lots when they do go back out and uh, into the real world that they they don't go and reoffend. That must have presented you with some difficult situations to deal with. Any that sort of spring to mind you can tell us about? Yeah, it is. A, it will do because again, like, I think young people, you know, they're that are actually placed on DTOs. You know, their their mindset is that if they're only going to be in there for like sort of six, seven months, you know, to try and change someone in six, seven months is not necessarily going to happen because they're going to go back to what they know. But yeah, it is, a, it is a challenging environment without shadow of doubt. You know, it has challenged you as a person and as an, in, in, as an individual because some of these young people are, are crying out for help. You know, they're crying out for help and they're in, they're in distress and they need someone to, to believe in them. They need someone to, you know, to try and help them, you know. But again, like it's, it's like anything, I would say that, you know, sometimes you've, you've got to meet each other halfway. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about your role here shortly 
and you always kept your hand in on the non-league side with a bit of coaching but after the prison service what other community projects were you involved in and what, what, what sort of roles did you have there? Yeah, so I went and worked in a residential setting. We were going with young people from the ages of nine to 17. And that was just, I was working in an assessment center where we would assess the needs of young people and basically just like sort of write an assessment report as to like sort of where would they be best, best pitched. So they may be going into foster care or it may well be placed into one of the homes down on the main site. We haven't mentioned Gillingham for a couple of minutes, so should we, um, <laughs> <laughs> in terms of returning to football, Coxie, it could be any, let's say you went to work for a club, let's not say Gillingham, but you actually went back into the game, didn't you, as a first team coach under Steve Lovell, who, not not the Bournemouth Steve Lovell, Eddie Howe's brother, but uh, the, the Welsh International Steve Lovell from yesteryear. Um, a year or so uh, as um, a first team coach back in football before you came down here mm -hmm. to, to take on the role you've got now, did that sort of light fires for you again to say that that's where your career might be for the rest of your, your football days, if you like? You know what, actually, prior to that, you know, I was working in the community and I was coaching the girls' academy. And like, for me, that's where I got like a bit more of a passion. Before that, you know, I wasn't really that interested in football. But having the, the, the group of individuals that I had, you know, and, lots, and playing lots of day, playing week in, week out, consistently that lighted that lit my fire you know that sort of and then you know when the opportunity come at you know lots of with Gillingham with Steve and Pato uh, yeah it was it was a good opportunity to take you know and lots of just again put myself out of my comfort zone you know because again like, I would be would have been a player before uh, so to be on the other side of the fence would have been just give me some more strings to my bow. After you left there you came here in September 2019 you touched on your role earlier, but just give us a little bit more insight into you know your day to day and more about the NCS and how people can get involved and stuff like that. Yeah, so the NCS, um, as I was kind of alluded before, is a is a government backed initiative, you know, and it's essentially targeting 16, 17 year olds, you know, the uh, that age group, year 11, year 12, who just essentially finished their uh, their GCSEs. And it is a two or three week program over the summer where we just basically look to upskill these young people through a series of different skill sets. It'll be like, you know, uh, problem solving, team building, you know, they'll go away for one week where they like, so will be posed different challenges. And in these challenges, like we talked about earlier on, it's about pushing them out of their comfort zone. Uh, not too much where they, they kind of, you know, go backwards, but just enough so they stretch and they grow. Um, and then there'll be just a series of workshops, you know, about, you know, budgeting, just life skills, you know, developing them before they go out into to the real world. Um, and then essentially that's sort of what we'll do at the end of it is that we'll have like, they will de de plan, design, design and plan a social action project. And this could be anything. It could be doing some volunteering. It could be campaigning. It could be fundraising to essentially just give something back to the, to the community. That must have been an incredibly challenging role in the last 12 months. It has been. Yeah, it has been. You know, I think with the NCS last year, it was one minute it was on, like, sort of, then it went too short, then we was going to do it digitally, you know. So um, whereas like, last year we was, you know, like, so we kind of, we was meant to be like, sort of, I think about 170 young people we was meant to like, sort of, kind of reach out to. Um, and lots of like embark on this project. We ended up lots of it was on a smaller scale. I think we ended up over the summer and the autumn with about 45, I think, altogether, which was a good number. And it showed lots of the young person, young people's intent to to start rebuilding the local community because I think now more than ever, you know, not just you know lots of the local community, but young people themselves, you know, they've missed out on so many opportunities to work experience, you know, to gain some core skills, you know, to develop them now more than ever that they need to, you know, take a leap of faith, you know, and lots of come and do something that's going to be worthwhile and be impactful for them. So that when they do leave school, college, you know, they've got some core fundamental skills that they can call upon. You spoke earlier about you had a, you had a big birthday celebration <laughs> last, last month. Amazing to think that you and I are both 40 in the same year. That's amazing. <laughs> now you've got a UA for B coaching license I believe have you mm -hmm. got any more designs to do football coaching again um not really not at the moment you know I think that's you know lots of yay for being I've got the youth mods as well I think that for me at the moment is is all right I think you know lots of I enjoy what I'm doing at the moment lots of youth work I enjoy making uh, trying to make a difference to young people 
Uh, so I'll continue to just upskill myself and get lots of whatever qualifications I need in, in this field more, you know, first and foremost. Just on a more general point, Coxie, about that area, um, a lot's made, of course, of opportunities for black coaches in this country and that often maybe people would feel not enough has, has been done to provide the, the pathways. I mean, Chris Powell, for example, obviously is involved with, with England these days. Darren Moore, high profile yeah. black manager, Jimmy Floyd, Hasselbank. Mm -hmm. What are your views on on what what is necessary still to be done for opportunities for black coaches in the game? I think there are initiatives out there, you know, um, that's all that are coming to the fore, but I would like to see more black coaches, you know, because you've got a lot of black players, you know, and years ago there wasn't as many black players, but now you're seeing like there's more black players there. There needs to be that next transition to to see lots of more black coaches, you know, lots of, um, of the ethnic background coming in and making that transition. Whether the opportunities are available, you know, that's all of it. it's hard to say. You know, I think opportunities are very limited, um, but I think there, there does need to be a little bit more done really to like, sort of make that transition, especially players, because I think players are going to be leaving football, you know, and then the, all that they know is, is coaching. So that'll be the next natural progression. So for me, there needs to be a smoother transition for, and, and for everybody really, like sort of making the actual, the, the opportunities equal. So anyone can have that transition. So anyone can have lots of pie for a first team role and lots of given to be given a fair opportunity in actually lots of succeeding in getting uh, lots getting a job. Is that area of the, the sort of governance of the game? Is that something that you're passionate about getting involved in or is it something you'd be happy to contribute to if you were asked? Or? I would always be happy to contribute mm. because I think it's important that, you know, we talk about inclusion and we talk about equality and diversity. I think it's important in any aspect that lots of what we're doing, whether it be football, whether it be just working, whether it be young people that are seeking out opportunities, the transition needs to be smooth and it needs to be opportunities, needs to be equal for everybody. Absolutely. And don't forget, fans uh, listening, you can uh, always get your questions in. Keep an eye out on the uh, official AFC Bournemouth social channels. We uh, we always put it out a day or so in advance to ask for your questions. So if you've got one you want to get in, make sure you uh, you do submit it. We always pick uh, a selection out to uh, to finish the pod off with. As I say, a couple we've already uh, answered throughout the course of it. But let's go to Ollie James Paddy on Twitter, first of all. Again, slightly touched on it earlier on, but what did you particularly like about Bournemouth that made you want to sign here? It was... It was for me, it was just a change, you know, initially. I didn't know anything about Bournemouth. You know, um, as I said, I grew up in London, you know, very rarely ventured outside of London. So for 26 years or so, like it was just all about lots of being in and, about, in and around London. So when the opportunity come to, to sign for Bournemouth, I, was, I just grabbed it, you know, and, and being down here, the first few days I was down here, I knew I'd made the right decision. You know, I remember lots of coming out the hotel and an older lady was saying good morning to me now that's not happening in London, you know, that sort of, that would not happen. So for me, it was, it was nice, you know, the friendly environment um, and a change of scenery more than anything else. I needed to have that change as well because my mum had just passed away lots of a few months before and having that transition to just get away and lots of try something new was, was, was paramount really. Johnny Bullet on Twitter is asking, how far do you think Eddie Howe would have gone in his playing career had it not been for injury? <laughs> Yeah, Eddie would have gone far. Eddie would have gone far. Eddie had all the credentials to to, to go really, really far. You know, um, I think he was already in the under 21 setup at the time. Um, so Eddie would have like, all gone really, really far. He had all the attributes. He had the right mindset, you know, lots all. And Eddie was probably a few years ahead of everyone else. You know, the way his nutrition, the way how he would eat, like, all and replenish with water and so forth. So he would have gone really, really far without a shadow of a doubt. Matt on Twitter is asking, Put you on the spot here. The best player you've ever played with? Played with? I think it would have to be, I'm, I'm going to say two, you know, the two players. So I'm going to say Rio, without a shadow of a doubt. But there's also uh, a player I used to play with at Burnley, Glenn Little, um, who, you know, he, he what he that boy could do on the pitch was just unbelievable. You know, so yeah, Rio and Glenn Little. This is a tough one. I, I'm not going to give you a lot of thinking time here, but Sarah's put a question on Facebook. Can you pick a five-a-side team of players that you've played with, your best five-a-side team? Well, obviously, Glenn Little. Glenn Little would be one. Rio. Uh, Rio would be another one. Three more. Uh, <laughs> Ian Wright. Uh, I'd even throw Paul Gascoigne in there. Um, and who else would I have? I'm going to have to go for Jimmy. <laughs> 
He won't, he won't forgive me. He'll be straight on to us. Our phone to be buzzing when he eventually hears this if he didn't say he Jimmy Glass. He won't forgive me, Jimmy. <laughs> Good to see Steve Fletcher didn't make the five-a-side team there as well. There's a bit of comeback for him. Um, last one from the fans. Uh, Ian Trebilco wanted to know what you're most proud of. What are you most proud of in your football career? What am I most proud of? I think for me, leading the team out of Wembley, you know, so I think there's a few things. Leading the team out of Wembley, um, getting promotion from the second division to the championship with Burnley and also uh, going to the World Cup. I mean, that is a, there's, a, there's some amazing things to have on your CV there. If you, it's pretty hard to pick between them. Um, Ian, it's been absolutely fascinating as ever for, for fans to listen to the, the, the thoughts, I guess, back on the career. And a lot of fans, of course, maybe of Bournemouth, we've emerged, I guess, as a club so much in the last few years that a lot of the fans listening may not have seen you play, but hopefully they've uh, learned a lot about you and your career over the last hour. And I know it's not always your favourite thing to do, speak publicly, is it? So No, no, it's not. <laughs> but you know something, again, as I said before, like I'm... I'm that's sort all of teaching these young people and I'm not sort of trying to get these young people to come out of their comfort zone and, you know, publicly speak and do all the things that they don't particularly want to do. And I can't be practicing and preaching to them <laughs> if I'm not doing it myself. So, you know. Well, we really appreciate your time and, uh, and thanks very much, Ian. No, thank you very much. Well, another fascinating hour on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. Uh, listening back to the thoughts over the career of, uh, of Ian Cox, plenty on that uh, on that CV, Neil. Absolutely fantastic. It's great to, to reminisce with Coxie. Met him on the first day that he came through the doors from Crystal Palace. Followed his career with us. Followed his career since. And like I said, you know, since he packed up his since he packed up playing, he was always on the end of a phone if ever we wanted a feature or something like that. And here we are now, work colleagues, twenty five years later. It's amazing. And I'll never get Gillingham mentioned as much in an official AFC Bournemouth podcast ever again. So if, just for that, what a day. Um, we'd love it if you could rate us wherever you get your podcast. Please do share it, of course, with your fellow Cherries fans. Anyone else that you think might be interested, generally Burnley fans, Gillingham fans, uh, Trinidad and Tobago followers, whatever. Um, our thanks again, of course, to Ian Cox from Neil Perrett and myself, Chris Temple, for the official AFC Bournemouth podcast. See you next time.